Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Fall Clearance Leading Edge, sponsored by MSA. My name is Kevin Drulli. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you will be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today will be Chris Irwin, ASHM, a global training instructor and safety program developer with MSA. Chris has worked to develop both fall protection and confined space entry training programs for the company and within the field of health and safety since 2000, excuse me, since 2008. Uh, and then one final note before we begin, please be aware during the course of the presentation that Chris will alert you to a video and handouts that can be found in the resources widget. Again, we thank all of you for tuning into this presentation. Chris, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Irwin, and uh, I do regularly perform fall protection uh, and confined space training as a part of my job for MSA, uh, and that's just a, a, a little bit about my background. But what I've uh, chosen here to talk about today is fall clearance and leading edge. So really there are two topics here. Uh, the first one I've chosen mainly because I think it's one of the, um, maybe the one of the more misunderstood topics when it comes to fall protection. I think a lot of people know uh, that when you fall, a lanyard, for example, is going to open a certain distance uh, to decelerate you to a stop. But if I were to ask somebody to do a fall clearance calculation for me, uh, from experience with uh, instructor-led groups or groups where I'm standing in front of the classroom, uh, I found that it's not always exactly clear how to, to run the numbers. Uh, and then on top of that, the, uh, the second topic is leading edge. Uh, and that's basically products that are designed for uh, going over the edge of a building, the edge of an I-beam. Uh, it's a definitely a large or a very important topic, I think, in this field. Uh, there is a lot of interest in that particular topic because not all products are designed uh, for going over uh, what's known as the leading edge. Uh, I think once we get through fall clearance and talk about how that works, uh, I think it really lends itself well to then transition to leading edge uh, because, again, we'll need to talk about fall clearance and some additional factors. Uh, so for that reason, I think the two marry pretty well together. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started into the presentation. Uh, I, I'd like to point out that we are just talking about a really small snippet uh, of what I would typically talk about in a longer fall protection course. Uh, typically, we would get into uh, things such as how strong does your anchor need to be, how do you properly attach to it, uh, a lot of those conversations about anchor strength and proper connection. Uh, another area we get into in a typical fall protection course would be body wear, uh, talking about how the full body harness is supposed to be donned, uh, tips for wearing it correctly, harness capacities, all those things. We're skipping right over each one of those topics today to talk about the connecting device. Uh, and that is going to include energy absorbing lanyards and self-retracting lifelines. Uh, all of the, the numbers that we're talking in in this particular presentation are going to relate mainly to the C part of the ABCs that we would normally talk about. So with that, uh, we'll get into the, uh, the, the first topic, which is lanyards. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, we'll be talking about uh, fall clearance with lanyards. So I would assume that uh, a lot of the people that are on this call have some background on the different types of uh, fall protection lanyards that are available. 
Uh, here I just have a couple of photographs of a couple different styles that are out there, one being what's called the pack style, uh, and another that I might refer to as a bungee style. In both cases, you have a fixed length of line where one end will attach to the user's harness and the other end attaches to the anchorage point or to an anchorage connector. Uh, if a fall occurs uh, with the pack style, the pack will open up uh, at, at impact or as the user falls into the system and their lanyard becomes straight, decelerating them to a stop. Uh, with the bungee style, there is a cord in the center of the device that stretches to bring the person to a stop. So with that, there are a couple of topics that I'd like to quickly mention. Uh, so first is just how these devices operate. Uh, what I always tell my students, and I try to demonstrate uh, by visually showing if I have a group in front of me, uh, is that there are two parts to a fall. And I think uh, you might not know the terminologies, but um, I think these are pretty straightforward concepts. So if you imagine a worker is standing on a work platform and they're quote unquote tied off and they fall, uh, there's going to be a point in that fall where they're free falling, uh, where their line is not taut yet, it's not catching them. Uh, free fall is the first part of the fall where the worker is accelerating. Uh, then once the lanyard catches, then the energy absorber is going to start to operate. Uh, and that's basically where we have what's called tear tape in the in the case of the pack style lanyard or the, uh, the line in the middle of the bungee style that stretches. Um, and basically it'll go a certain distance to bring you a stop. I want to throw out the first couple numbers uh, of this presentation today. The first thing that you need to know is when it comes to free fall, the law limit max free fall to no more than six feet, which initially makes sense when we consider that a typical lanyard is six feet in length. Uh, then once you hit the end of the line and it starts to slow you down, uh, when you hit into deceleration distance and the energy absorber begins to act, uh, the max deceleration distance with most lanyards is going to be four feet. So you'll have six foot of free fall followed by four feet of deceleration distance. Those numbers will be necessary to help us understand the, the fall current scenario that I'm going to talk about. So. One of the things that I included with this presentation in the resources link, and I don't know if everybody's had a chance to go in there and, and take a look to see what documents are in there, but one of the things that's in there is a number of activities on fall currents. Uh, if you did not get in there and pull those out, that's fine. I'm going to try to walk through those activities uh, just using the slideshow, but uh, I'm going to kind of describe some of the questions that are in there. And uh, it, it is a resource that if you've got it printed out, you can fill it out as we go. Uh, I also included the answer sheet. So if you just want to listen and try to follow me, then you can use the answer sheet uh, after the, the presentation. So the first scenario that I have up is a fall clearance one using a what we call a white label six foot lanyard. Uh, in this particular case, we have a worker who's six feet tall. And we'll, we'll use the, uh, the picture on the slide to try to imagine uh, this scenario. Uh, we have a worker that's six feet tall and they're standing on a surface that's 14 feet off the ground. So in this case, if we envision the, the pictogram we're looking at here, we'll say that they're standing 14 feet off the ground, they're a six foot tall worker. We're going to assume their anchorage point, uh, which we can see here is above them. Uh, so we're working with at least 20 feet between the anchorage point and the ground. And my question in the scenario is if there are no obstructions below this worker and they're using the lanyard that I've described, uh, how much clearance do they need to have available? Will they hit? Will they not? Uh, so I'd like you to just kind of look at this picture using what I've described so far and see if you can do in your head uh, a quick calculation to determine whether or not this person has the correct clearance. Uh, so if we look at the letters in this very basic diagram, I'll run through specifically what we are going to consider. And again, this is uh, laid out a little bit more in the handout. Uh, again, I'll walk through it here, but just know that the answers that I'm giving are also in this handout, uh, in the answer sheet that comes with it. Uh, so the very first thing that always needs to be considered when doing fall clearance with a lanyard is how much clearance is available. So in this case, we'll say that the bottom of the slide is the ground. There are no obstructions. 
So I mentioned previously that we have approximately 20 feet between the anchor and the ground. That's the space available. So the next question is, how much space will the system require? How much space will the lanyard require if this person falls? Uh, that's where the letters in this diagram come in. So letter A, uh, I always ask what letter A stands for uh, or what the number should be that goes in there. Uh, I'll just give the quick answer. Uh, it's not going to be free fall. It's the length of the lanyard. So if we measure the length of a normal shock absorbing lanyard, it's typically going to be six feet. So beside A, that's the number that, that I would put there. Uh, if you look at B, you can see this hopefully in the, the picture. That's where the energy absorbers start to open up. Uh, as I mentioned previously, with most lanyards, the deceleration, the, uh, the distance this will open up in the case of a fall, is no more than four feet. Uh, C uh, is uh, accounting for the height of the worker. So in this particular case, uh, I, I realize that all workers are different heights, but we typically use six feet as the height uh, of the average worker. Uh, and then there's a D also on my worksheet that I didn't account for, but uh, or I should say the picture doesn't account for, but it's very important, and that's what we call safety margin. So we typically add some extra distance between the worker's feet and the ground to make sure uh, we d if we do make any small errors in calculations or add incorrectly by a, a foot, they're still not going to hit. The typical number that we put in for safety margin is three feet. So if we add A of 6 plus B of 4 plus C of 6 and D of 3 feet, that should give us a total of 19 feet. So I said previously that uh, from the ground to the anchorage point, 20 feet was available. And I'm saying now that the system requires 19 feet. Uh, if the system only requires 19 but we have 20 available, that tells us the worker has space to fall and they're not going to hit. Uh, then the second question that I have on here is how much force will the worker feel in this scenario? And that's something that uh, definitely is easier to do if you have a lanyard in, in front of you that's available to look at. Uh, on the worksheet, I do have a picture of a label that comes on, again, a standard lanyard. And it's giving you some data that I've already mentioned, which is it's designed for no more, more than six foot of free fall. Um, that's a big number that you'll see that will be on most lanyards. I want to be clear, you should always read the label and make sure that the numbers aren't different than what I'm saying. Uh, and then on top of that, it's going to give you uh, an average arresting force. When properly used, a normal white label lanyard of the sort that I'm describing will subject the user to a force of about 900 pounds. Uh, and maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, essentially, in a fall OSHA state, that fall forces must be kept at less than 1,800 pounds. So uh, in this case, we're well below that 1,800 pounds on average. Uh, so we know that not only is the person not going to hit, but their fall forces will be at a safe level. So if I switch over to the next slide, this is just a confirmation of what I talked about. Uh, so again, here are the numbers that I mentioned, length of lanyard, uh, deceleration distance for B, the height of the worker and the safety margin. What I'd like to do now, uh, well, quickly I'll, I'll go to the next slide and, and actually show what a white label lanyard looks like. So here's just the data that I talked about. Uh, so if you look at a standard lanyard, again, be sure to check with your lanyards to make sure that they have these same numbers. Uh, they are designed for six foot of free fall and then uh, the distance that you'll decelerate is uh, 48 inches or 4 feet, and the average arresting force will be 900 pounds. So the next scenario, if you're following along on your activity sheet, is uh, one where the worker instead moves to being on top of their anchorage point. So if we imagine the scenario that I just used and say that that worker jumps from the platform they were on, and instead they stand on the top of their anchorage point that they were just tied to. So we make the platform that he was standing on disappear, so he's not going to hit that on the way down. And really the only thing that's changed is he's now standing on top of the anchorage point that he was standing below previously. And basically this scenario asks you <clears throat> to analyze whether or not he still has enough clearance uh, and also a second question, how much force this person will feel if he falls? 
Uh, so again, without making uh, you necessarily uh, work on that on your own, I'll try to lead you through uh, how I would have a student look at this question in the classroom. Uh, so uh, we always do fall clearance the same way with lanyards. We'll always measure from the closest obstacle below, which is still the ground. Uh, I told you previously uh, that it was approximately 20 feet from the ground to the anchorage point. That is exactly the same in this scenario. Uh, so if we go and we do our A, B, C, D additions again, I want to run through what those numbers would look like. So for A, uh, if we uh, look at the fall clearance calculation once more, the length of the lanyard is still six feet. I mentioned previously that uh, A is always going to be the length of the lanyard. The way to look at this is when that worker falls, the length of the lanyard cannot change. A six-foot lanyard is going to stay that way. And if it's hard to envision how A did not change, imagine that person pausing in mid-flight and imagine that they're going to end up essentially exactly where they were uh, in the picture previously. So below their anchorage point uh, and with a similar amount of slack in their lanyard. I know we can't pause a fall, but uh, for me that's the easiest way to envision things. So the length of the lanyard stays six feet. Uh, the deceleration distance cannot possibly mo be more than four feet. Uh, that's uh, essentially all the farther a lanyard will let you go in deceleration. Uh, the height of the worker will not change, so it's still going to be six feet. And then the safety margin is going to be the same three feet we talked about. So essentially, when it comes to fall clearance, I've given you a slightly different scenario here. However, the uh, fall clearance still works out for this person they're still not going to hit the ground. Uh, distance from ground to anchor is still 20 feet. System still re only requires 19 feet. So from a fall clearance standpoint, this person's perfectly fine. Uh, the second question, though, I should say, uh, letter C, I should say, on my, my sheet, is how much fall force will this worker likely experience? That's where we run into a snag. If that person is standing on top of their anchorage point, they're going to have more free fall than they had previously. So in the last example, uh, where their back D-ring on their harness and their anchor point were about the same height, now they're starting out, we'll say, approximately six feet above their anchor. So they're going to need to fall to the height of their anchor, and then as they fall past, they still have six more feet to go. This is important because in a six-foot free fall, there's still more energy absorber to keep forces low. If this person free falls from a tie-up point at foot level, which is a fairly common activity that I see, they will go all the way through their energy absorber hitting into what's called the backup strap. That's there to make sure the lanyard can't separate into two pieces. Uh, and from, a, from that standpoint, it's good. The worker's not going to separate their lanyard and, and end up on the ground. That's the good news. The bad news is if you deplete all the energy absorber falling that first part of the free or the first part of the deceleration distance, the extra force that's left over once you tear through the energy absorber will be put on your body. Uh, I can't necessarily say anything official on this, but from the testing that I've seen, I've seen fall, fall forces as high as 3,000 pounds. So in other words, they'll feel 900 pounds as the energy absorber works, but at the point where they rip through the end of it and hit in the back of the strap, the, the force will spike and we will be looking at a significantly high fall force on that person's body. So the question is, what could be done to deal with this issue to make sure the person will neither hit nor see high fall force? And essentially, the answer to that question has to do with a special type of a lanyard that not a lot of people are aware of. I know some people have seen these, not necessarily, I would say the majority of my students have not. Uh, this is what's called a black label lanyard. Uh, so I was talking previously about a six-foot free-fall white label lanyard. Uh, that is a specification from the American National Standards Institute. ANSI puts out test criteria for fall protection equipment that companies like mine manufacture. And for standard lanyards, uh, they state that a white label lanyard is, is going to most likely be the most common that's out there. No, they don't really necessarily make the statement that one type of lanyard is more correct than another. But what they do say is if we have situations of extended free fall, just like this that I'm describing here, 
this is the correct lanyard. Uh, so essentially, this is a six-foot lanyard. It's no longer than the one I just described. Uh, from end to end, it's the same length. The difference is this is allowed for foot-level tie-offs. Uh, and it's very clear on the label, stating that this is a 12-foot free-fall lanyard. Uh, how it's going to operate is, is very, very, very similar to what we saw previously, but there are some different numbers. So with a foot-level tie-off or 12-foot or free-fall, uh, we will be looking at an average arresting force of 1,350 pounds. Uh, and then as that energy absorber does its job, it's going to ensure that even with that extended freefall, that person will not decelerate more than 60 inches or 5 feet. So our deceleration distance changes just a little bit. Uh, if we take this back to the scenario where the worker was tied off uh, and standing at foot level, I can tell you from a fall current standpoint, they'll be okay with this lanyard um, because they had 20 feet available and their lanyard required, I should say their fall arrest system requires 20 feet. Uh, in fact, they've got three feet of safety margin below their feet, so they're still going to be hanging above the down. Uh, so from a fall current standpoint, they're good. And from a fall force standpoint, they're also less than 1,800 pounds, which is what the law requires. So. Uh, I think with this particular one, I disguised the fall clearance question, or I should say a fall force question, in a fall clearance scenario. And it's something that I definitely want to bring people's attention to. It's, it's very important to understand. All right, transitioning over, uh, there is a different type of connecting device that's out there that's known as a self-retracting lifeline. Uh, these go by many names, yo-yos, uh, blocks, uh, SRLs, retractables, uh, we don't necessarily need to get into all those names right now. But there are basically two types that I'd like to mention. There is what's called the self-retracting lifeline and the PFL. And the simplest way to differentiate between the two is an SRL is a bigger device. It's meant to be hung over as we see in this particular photograph to the right. Uh, and we pull the end of the line down to the worker. Uh, the smaller device is called the PFL. That stands for personal fall limiter. Here, that actually means that you wear the housing ends, the part that has the line coiled up on the inside, on the ends that the worker's on. Uh, and it's personal because you can carry it around with you. So in one case, the, the big housing is, has enough line in it that we wouldn't want to wear it on our back. Uh, or we wouldn't want to wear the end that has the line in, on our back. Um, in the other case, it's a smaller device where that won't be an issue. So I, I just want to quickly differentiate between those. Uh, but essentially, the way these work is they're kind of like a seatbelt in a car. So whichever end you're correctly attached to, if you fall, uh, when the line pulls out quickly, these small uh, fingers inside the housing, are, which are called paws, flip out. They lock off. And much like a seatbelt, the device quickly locks off. The major benefit of one of these over a lanyard is they stop a fall much more quickly. Um, so with a lanyard, we talked about possibly going six feet uh, in free fall before it even begins to catch you. If you have a, a high anchorage point with one of these, uh, a lot of times they'll lock off within a matter of inches to catch you. Uh, and that's definitely something, if you can ever see a, a test where these things are demonstrated, uh, I think uh, it's something that really helps you see the benefits of one of these devices over, over for example, a lanyard. The uh, third scenario that I have in the handout that we passed out, or that's in, I should say, in the, uh, the resources link, is a fall current scenario with SRLs. And since we covered this with lanyards, it's important to cover it here as well uh, to kind of show you uh, a small difference. So uh, very similar uh, way of approaching this as we did with the last scenario. Um, Again, if we were in a class where you were my students, I would probably have you try to work through this on your own to see what you came out with, but I'll, I'll lead you through it to describe the process. Uh, step one is, again, determine what the available clearance is. Uh, this is going to be the major difference between lanyards and SRLs. So in this case, I'm actually going to measure from the ground or closest obstacle uh, to the work surface. I'm not actually measuring to the anchorage point this time. I'm just going to measure to the worker's feet. So for my example, I, told, I said that the worker is standing 10 feet off the ground. So uh, that's just a number that's been made up. Uh, we could throw in any number from any of your work locations. 
uh, as that example number, but we're going to use 10 feet for my example. Uh, so we'll say he has 10 feet of distance below him. Uh, and the question is, if he falls, is he going to hit? Uh, well, in this particular case, the first question might be, why are we not measuring from ground to anchor to see how much space is available? And the answer is, we often don't know the length of an SRL. So if I've got a 30-foot uh, SRL, uh, as I walk around below it, I will extract line, line will get pulled back in as I move around. So unlike a six-foot lanyard, we don't know the length of an SRL at all times. So in this particular case, uh, if we measure from the work surface to the ground, we can eliminate calculating for the length of the SRL, something that we're not going to know. Once we've done that, fall clearance is very easy with an SRL. So in my scenario, I ask you to please calculate the clearance. And essentially, it only asks for two letters, A and B. Uh, the first one is what's known as maximum arrest distance. And uh, for most SRLs, uh, they're going to fall into one of two, two classes. So I talked about with lanyards, you have white label and black label. With this, you have class A and class B. It's two styles of, of SRL that have different operating characteristics for how, far they, or how quickly they stop the fall. So for maximum arrest distance, if we're talking about a Class A SRL, and I'll bring up a, uh, a slide on this shortly, we're talking about a total stopping distance of two feet. So between the distance that you go before it locks off and then once it locks off and the internal brakes start to operate, it will not let you go more than two feet, uh, which is significantly different than what a lanyard would do. Uh, so in this particular case, we weren't using a Class A. Uh, we were actually using what's called a Class B, which is definitely the more prevalent of the SRLs that are out there. And it has a total stopping distance of four and a half feet. Uh, when I say Class A and Class B, I should back up and say, again, that's an ANSI designation. That's not an MSA thing. Uh, so uh, it's going to need to fall into one of those two categories, regardless of who manufactures it. Um, so we'll say that we're using a Class B, which has a total stopping distance of four and a half feet. Uh, and then again, safety margin is exactly the same as what we said before. So uh, we'll just plug in that three feet uh, number that we talked about. So if I go over to uh, the next slide showing uh, all the numbers in there, uh, I mentioned in my scenario that we had between the ground and the work surface, 10 feet. And uh, that's what we have available. The question is, how much does the system require? Well, if we're using a Class B SRL, then my maximum arrest distance is going to be four and a half feet, and my safety margin is three feet uh, for a total of seven and a half feet. Uh, the system only requires seven and a half. I have 10 available, so again, I'm not going to hit. Uh, a lot of times in class, I'll get questions on, you know, what if we're only five or six feet off the ground? How do we make that work? Uh, bottom line is with a lanyard, it's going to be very, very hard. Uh, on the other hand, if I were to switch, uh, for example, maximum rest distance, in this case, a four and a half to a class A, two foot max rest distance, and add that to my safety margin of three feet, now we only require five feet total. Uh, and we can accommodate in a lot of situations. The bottom line is with a, uh, an anchorage point located above the worker, uh, we have a very good situation, or a much better situation where it's more likely uh, that we're going to be able to meet our fall clearance numbers. I did want to bring up, again, as we talked about white and black label, I do want to show, I do want to show the, again, the operating characteristics of the two types of self-retracting lifelines and PFL. So within this category of the big units and the small ones, they're all going to be either class A or class B. Um, with a class A SRL, uh, they do stop you very fast. Uh, total stopping distance of no more than 24 inches, two feet. Uh, you'll see the force is a little bit higher. It's 1,350 pounds. Um, but that's still below the allowable 1,800-pound force specified by OSHA. Uh, with a Class B, we talked about that being the more common style that's out there. Uh, your average arrest force will be lower, 900 pounds, but it'll take a little farther to bring you a stop. Uh, regardless of the style that we're using, uh, I think that a lot of users uh, discover that I think I get a lot of comments in class that, that say, you know, something to the effect of, is this where the technology is going? Is this 
the connecting device of the future? And, and I, I think the short answer is, is quite possibly yes. Uh, there is more and more that we can do with an SRL than we could with a lanyard. Uh, and probably the most significant benefit is the maximum arrest distance. We can see these things stop us much, much faster than a lanyard does. Uh, so that really helps us from a fall plan standpoint. So at this point, uh, I would like to uh, transition over uh, to this concept of leading edge. I think it's good that we've talked about fall clearance before this uh, because uh, going from a lanyard to an SRL to leading edge, there's going to be a different fall clearance uh, way of looking at things altogether. Uh, but I think uh, it's important to know proper operating characteristics of the other devices before we transition over here. So if we look at the photograph that we have in the slide, we see a worker who uh, appears to be using a, a longer length SRL uh, that has a, a cable connector. So we don't see the housing end and we don't see where the anchorage point is, but we do see the line coming off the edge, or I should say across the, uh, the top of this building. It goes over top the, uh, in this case, the uh, cable guardrail that he's working on the other side of. Uh, and, and the back of the line connects to the back of the harness at the D-ring. What leading edge talks about is a situation where if that worker falls, their line is going to cut in either to that guardrail or to the edge that's just in front of them. And the major limitation with most all SRLs that are not of this specific style is if that worker falls on the side that he's on, all he has is cable uh, with a snap hook connected to his back. If he were to fall and go over that edge, that cable most likely will bite into the roof's edge, not allowing more line to pull out of the, the housing of the unit, and it doesn't allow the brakes to operate. Uh, and when that happens, and I've unfortunately seen some cases where this has occurred, uh, when that happens, the question comes down to how much force is that person going to generate, and is the cable strong enough that it's not going to break uh, in, in the fall of the edge. And I've seen some cases where uh, ultimately the cable is not strong enough. Uh, so there has been a real demand, a real need for a specific type of SRL that can be used to go over edges. And the industry has finally started to comply with that, uh, coming up with what's known as the leading edge SRL uh, and leading edge PFL as well. Uh, so I would reference really quickly, uh, at this point, there is, uh, in the resources link, there is a video that MSA put together on a personal fall limiter that it's designed uh, specifically for leading edge. And I really wanted to get this video in here uh, so that you could take a look and, and see what leading edge testing looks like. Uh, the video essentially shows you the, the two main drop tests that we do in our laboratory to make sure this device uh, in the design phase is working correctly. Uh, one of them is a drop test where we essentially drop a 282 pound weight uh, from six feet above, I'm sorry, five feet above an edge straight down onto the edge. Uh, and then another one is the same drop, but the weight is angled. So when the weight drops, the line abrades, it cuts across the edge. Uh, not only is the, the bending of the line over the edge a difficult part of the test to pass, but the edge itself uh, is, makes things extremely difficult. The ANSI test edge for leading edge requires that the, uh, the sharpness of the diameter be no more than 0.005 I'm sorry, zero zero five inches, uh, which is very similar to the sharpness of a knife. Uh, so uh, with regular equipment that doesn't have the strong enough line, that doesn't have the proper operating characteristics, uh, it's very easy for it to cut. So I would encourage you to take a moment to uh, pull that video up and take a look, uh, and it's something you could uh, even kind of check out uh, as we're continuing on. But I think it might help you understand the severity of the test and how difficult it is to pass. So I would like to mention as, uh, as you're doing that, um, there is a small discussion point that often comes up when it comes to leading edge that is important to talk about. And that's the name itself, leading edge. Uh, and essentially what's happened here is uh, if we back way up, 
the original term leading edge comes from OSHA. Uh, so OSHA originally came up with this terminology talking about a very specific type of work. Uh, and the OSHA definition of what leading edge is is, uh, is given here. And there's a, an example of an activity where a leading edge uh, could possibly be applied uh, on this slide. And essentially, in OSHA's definition or OSHA terminology, this means an unprotected side and edge of floor, roof, or formwork for a floor or other walking surface, which changes location as additional floor, roof, decking, or formwork sec sections are placed, formed, or constructed. So imagine a uh, roof deck uh, or, uh, in this case, we see uh, wood paneling that's being put down and, and perhaps a residential um, type construction. Uh, but as that worker lays the floor down, the, the roof down, whatever that, that's going to be, their fall zone is constantly changing. So if you can imagine them putting down the panels and moving around, the zone where they could fall is constantly changing. Uh, leading edge work in OSHA terms is something that's very, very specific. There are only certain types of workers that would probably do this type of work. Um, most edges that a person is going to work on are finished. In other words, we're not laying paneling, we're not laying something down uh, that keeps changing uh, as, we, as we put more of the floor down. Um, what happens was I think uh, people seized on this term and they started using it for all edges. So imagine if you've got a rooftop that's finished, there's no construction of the roof taking place, it's already done, uh, and that worker's moving around near the edge of the roof. In OSHA term terminology, that would be called an unprotected edge. Uh, but I think a lot of people have just started to call that a leading edge. So I want to make this distinction because OSHA does talk about leading edge. When I talk about the concepts, we're talking about equipment that's designed to bend over an edge. So when I talk about leading edge, it's not the OSHA definition. We're talking about the ANSI de definition. This is equipment that's designed to go over edges similar to what we looked at in that photograph previously, where I said the line could basically separate. If we look at this device, this is an example of MSA technology that is designed uh, for going over edges. Uh, this is what's called the V-edge. And it's a normal self-protecting lifeline in the sense that there's a line wrapped around a drum on the inside of the housing. Uh, the main difference that I'll draw your attention to is the black piece on the end of the line. Uh, that's going to be the end that's attached near the worker. And if they fall over the edge, what is in that black casing is an energy absorber. If that line bites into the edge when they fall over, the energy absorber will deploy, limiting the amount of force that's going to be put on that line, keeping it to a force that will not cut it in two. Uh, this is a leading edge designed and tested unit that is designed to be able to take uh, the, be able to pass the type of a test that I talked about previously, which is a five foot drop over an edge that has a diameter of 0 .005 inches. Uh, imagine something that pretty close to a knife's edge. Uh, if you put your finger on it and run the cross, you could possibly cut yourself. So when we talk about leading edge, we're talking about equipment that meets the SRL-LE designation. So if you look at the tag, that's what you're looking for. Uh, a lot of times, once you verify that it's an SRL-LE, you're going to notice that energy absorber on the end. I want to caution against just seeing an energy absorber and assuming it's correct for this. Uh, you need to make sure you read the tag and it, and it has it on there. Uh, there is, is another term that often comes up, and that's sharp edge. Uh, so leading edge versus sharp edge. Uh, sharp edge is something that is very briefly mentioned in ANSI, but it's uh, essentially not defined when it comes to its sharpness. Um, basically, when we're talking about a leading edge, if it's falling over a roof, we could be talking about something that's relatively dull. Uh, but a lot of times we might be talking about something that has kind of a filed off sharp edge to it. When we talk about leading edge, uh, it encompasses this concept of sharp edge. In the leading edge test, it specifies that we got a drop test over something that has a diameter of 0 .005 inches. Uh, so sharp edge is something that's contained within this concept of leading edge, uh, but uh, essentially just because it, it comes up, uh, when talking about this, we just need to know that leading edge is going to encompass not only the dull edge uh, that we possibly could fall over or something with a sharper edge uh, up to that diameter that I've re referenced several times. Uh, so 
And again, this is kind of talks about what we talked about. Anything that's going to be leading edge uh, will also incorporate that that sharp edge in it. Uh, so a couple things that we should mention when it comes to these devices. Uh, I talked about they do have some special characteristics where they can, uh, where they're able to meet uh, a drop over edges like this. Um, first off, you've got a, a lot of times some type of energy absorber on the end of the line. I shouldn't say a lot of times all devices I've seen have an energy absorber on the end. Uh, and it's part of the unit, so it's not a standalone. It's not something you attach to your SRL that you already have. It's built and designed with that, with that energy absorber on there. Uh, and, and a lot of times it might also have a, a thicker line, a larger line. Uh, on this slide, I've also shown a couple of the, or a few of the tests that ANC requires these things be tested to. Uh, the dynamic performance test is a straight down drop from five feet with a 282 pound weight. Uh, dynamic strength is a test where after we do the drop test, we then pull on the line uh, to, I'm sorry, static strength is one where we pull on the line to a thousand pounds to see if it still holds. Uh, it can't break after the test. And then dynamic strength is the one where we swing the weight from one side to the other, abrading the line of the edge. These devices are extremely robust. They can take extremely harsh conditions. Um, so the last scenario is asking some questions about leading edge. Uh, so again, this is on the worksheet. And uh, essentially in this case, uh, we will try to zoom in on some of the things being shown in this scenario. Uh, if you have the handout printed, that would also be very useful. Um, but the first question, uh, or I should say the scenario says that this worker is uh, 10, or I'm sorry, 20 feet up from the, uh, the ground, uh, and there are no obstructions below him. And he uh, could possibly fall off that edge. And the question is, again, is he okay from a fall clearance standpoint? Uh, if we look at our, our uh, picture that we have here, um, we'll use that to answer our questions. So the first question is, what is being covered by the letter D uh, in the pictogram? And if you are looking closely at this, that's, the, uh, that's the, the D, or I should say the letter that's between the housing of the unit and where the worker is standing on the edge. And uh, this is going to be different from one unit to the next, so this is where knowing your equipment and how it operates is important. Um, but letter D is saying that this housing needs to be set at least 30 inches away from the edge. In other words, if we fall, we don't want to bend the housing over the edge. We want to make sure the line is what's coming into contact with the edge. So there is a certain what we call setback distance that the device has to be back from the edge. Then if we look at the side-to-side -side arrows, uh, the next question is, what do those tell us? And those are uh, telling us, essentially in this case, that this unit allows us to walk uh, five feet to the left and five feet to the right of center line. So this person has a work area of approximately 10 feet, five feet to either side uh, of where they're currently standing. Um, those are limitations that are important. If that person goes six feet, seven feet uh, to one of the sides, then they could experience too much free fall. They could also experience a case where uh, they might uh, actually hit the ground because they have so much line paid out uh, and the unit can't operate quickly enough to catch them. Uh, the question I had in letter C is, does the worker have adequate fall clearance? Uh, so I said that the worker is standing 20 feet off the ground, uh, and we need to look at our chart to determine if, if we have enough information. And in this case, we don't have to actually do any addition, any calculations. Uh, if you look at the numbers on the front of the pictogram, it says 20 feet. So if you look closely there, you'll see that uh, 20 feet, what's required for fall clearance, no addition required, uh, as long as you got more than 20 feet, uh, that's all of your numbers. That's your max arrest distance, that's your uh, safety margin, all wrapped in one. So if I say that he had 20 feet available, the system only requires 20 feet, again, we can say that uh, he's good to go, he's not going to have the grounds. So there are a, a few things about these, uh, really to wrap things up on leading edge that um, are important, and I'll, I'll start by using the pictograms that I have at the bottom of the slide to, to talk about those. Um, often I'll ask students to analyze this uh, pictures and see if they, see what they mean to them to make sure they, they understand what it's talking about. So with Roman numeral one, uh, or I should say just the, the first picture on the slide, we see the unit set back with a check mark uh, above, a green check mark. In that case, what the pictogram is trying to show you is that horizontal use of the product is okay. 
Uh, that's not true of most SRLs, but with leading edge, they are designed for horizontal use, i.e. attached at ground level behind the worker. Uh, the next uh, circle that we have, the unit is tied off overhead. This is trying to show you that with the green check mark once again, that using it overhead like a normal SRL is allowed. Uh, this is actually a unit that can do both horizontal and vertical tie-off, uh, so that would be appropriate. Uh, the next photograph or the next picture is showing one where the housing is too close to the edge. So we're not biting the line in properly. It's actually bending the housing of the edge. Remember, we have to maintain that setback. And then finally, and this is probably the one that maybe comes as a big surprise, there are limitations currently to the leading edge test. Uh, so one of them is basically when we bend the line in the test, it's only going over a single edge. So one of the first limitations is these are not designed currently uh, per ANSI, uh, so none of the manufacturers are necessarily able to even design to a standard yet because it's not, it's not established for us uh, to go over a parapet wall where we have two edges that, that the line's cutting into. That's not to say in the future that they won't be able to do that, but currently the standard doesn't tell us to test for that. Uh, so right now I think manufacturers are probably gathering more data on how well these things operate um, in a situation like that. Um, but that's currently, as you can see, not something that's permitted. All right, uh, so some things, uh, a few more things I'd like to say just kind of in wrapping up with Leading Edge. Uh, the only required method for us distinguishing that you're looking at a Leading Edge product is on the label. So the very first thing that I'll, I'll state that's really important is don't assume by looking at it that you can tell if you've got a Leading Edge product or not. You need to read the label. Uh, the first thing that's going to be very clear on there is it's going to tell you whether or not this is a type SRL LE. That's really important. If it doesn't say that, then we can't, uh, we can't know that, that we're using the correct device for that. Um, beyond that, uh, at that point, you're going to want to look at your manufacturer's information to see operating characteristics. So we just looked at a pictogram that told you setback distance, it told you side-to-side -side movement, it told you what fall clearance needed to be. Uh, those are all things that are going to change their variables from one manufacturer to the next. So make sure you open that booklet that comes with the products to make sure that you understand the operating characteristics of whatever it is that you may be using. There are some limitations currently with how these things operate. As I mentioned, right now, the only test that ANSI specifies is falling over a steel edge, uh, an unburred edge, uh, with a radius of 0 0.005 inches. And that's a very sharp edge. But there are some things that we still recognize uh, are things that you need to deal with probably in some of your work environments uh, that aren't currently tested for because they're not in the standard. Um, rebar edges would be an example of that. Uh, concrete edge, which is extremely common, uh, or edges of decking. Uh, these are things that are not currently spelled out. I can tell you manufacturers are starting to do their own internal tests on some of these things. Uh, MSA is an example. I know we've done some internal testing on concrete edges. Um, we have not released a policy on these yet, um, but I can tell you somewhere down the road, not yet, somewhere down the road, you'll probably see some things in the instructions that tell you uh, where we're allowing more and more types of edges to, to be uh, being protected against. So that's something else to look out for, but realize that we're still somewhat in the early phases of um, capabilities with this equipment. Uh, so I think that's one of the major things that, that needs to be stressed. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'd like to wrap things up. Uh, definitely take any questions that I can uh, in the time we have remaining. I appreciate everybody's time today. I, I certainly hope that uh, the information was as, as clear as it could be. Uh, uh, trying to reach out to all of you uh, online here, but um, definitely happy to help. Here's my contact information for anybody that would like to reach out to me with further questions. Uh, any kind of talk on anything OSHA or any products like this, I'd be happy to help out with. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it back over, and we'll take a look at the questions. Excellent. Great job, Chris. Thanks for your insights and expertise. Before we do start the Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. We appreciate your input because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. And with that, we will get to some questions. 
Um, first, can you expand on uh, a Class A and B with LE technology? Does MSA sell an SRL Class A LE? Uh, all right. So uh, we, we mentioned a lot of different numbers and styles of equipment today, and, and that's a very good question. So Class A and Class B is something that applies to normal SRLs. So a Class A, remember, has a total stopping distance of 24 inches, and a Class B has a stopping distance of 4.5 feet. Um, at the end of the day, I, I did say that leading edge devices, uh, in some cases, or at least an example I showed, can be used traditionally. In, in other words, they can be used overhead. And in those cases, if you read the label, they're going to give you operating characteristics as to whether or not they fall in the Class A category or Class B category. Uh, so in the case of the one that I was showing you here, it was Class B. The uh, deceleration distance was four and a half feet. Uh, I don't know uh, what is all on the market right now that is both leading edge and Class A. Um, I can say that right now our products are going to fall into the category of Class B and leading edge. Uh, but just know that in theory, uh, it could be leading edge and Class A or Class B. Uh, but if we're going to talk maximum arrest distance of Class A or Class B, that's in a situation where we're talking about where it's anchored overhead. If it's anchored at foot level, then we need to look at the clearance charts that were presented for foot level tie-off. Okay, uh, next, one, question. next one asks, um, in what situation would fall restraint, such as a lanyard with a rope grab device, be acceptable for leading edge work? Uh, so that's one that's uh, a little bit of a trickier question to answer. So a rope grab is basically an adjustable uh, type of a trolley that runs on a rope back and forth. Um, a lot of times well, they were originally designed for, uh, again, vertical use, but I, I know they're a lot of times used for roofing type work. Um, essentially fall restraint is something that doesn't allow the worker to get to the edge to fall in the first place. So imagine a dog on a leash. Uh, you can walk up to the edge, but you can't get over it. Uh, fall restraint is always considered to be better than fall arrest if we can make it happen. Um, generally speaking, the most proper device for fall restraint is one that no matter what the worker does, tug and pull, move around, adjust things, it'll never let them get to the edge in the first place. So we're talking maybe a fixed length lanyard that won't let them get there in the first place. Uh, if we're using a rope grab, the worker could walk out to where they need, adjusting the rope grab to get to a point where they can't fall over the edge. Uh, so in theory, it's possible to set it up for fall restraint. My main issue with that, uh, from a safety person's perspective, that's my background, is uh, if we're relying on the worker to properly adjust and not let themselves have enough line to get over the edge, a lot of times they don't really like the, uh, the lanyard pulling on their back they might adjust it too far out to where they could fall off that edge, and it's no longer too restrained. Uh, so I've seen cases where uh, I have definitely seen rope grabs being used for fall restraint. I've also seen regulations where it's prohibited um, to try to use something like that for fall restraint. Uh, I recently did some work in uh, Washington State, and I believe it is there where they actually spelled out uh, not being able to use this for fall restraint unless it was specifically designed by the manufacturer for that. Um, but at the end of the day, if we can if we can accomplish restraint, which is where the worker can't get to the edge, and know that the worker is not going to do something to jeopardize uh, the situation and, and, and allow a fall that's not desired, um, restraint is always better than fall arrest. Uh, another good question. Thank you. Next one. Do conditions such as heat, cold, and wet conditions affect performance of the leading edge? Um, so. That's actually a really good question. From my review of the uh, leading edge standard, I, I honestly have to go back and look. Uh, a lot of times with all equipment, whether it's, um, whether it's a lanyard or an SRL, there are different types of conditioning tests where we'll put it in a freezer overnight to try to simulate conditions in Alaska, for example, or we'll dunk it in water and leave it in there for a certain period before doing the test to simulate very wet conditions. Uh, all of these products are going to have been tested uh, in those types of situations. Uh, to my knowledge, those are applicable to the Class A and Class B designations, in other words, to the main SRL tests. Uh, I don't know, and I could be wrong on this, so I don't really want to uh, uh, emphatically say that 
this is the case. But I, I don't believe they have specific conditioning tests for a leading edge, um, but I could be wrong on that. But I can tell you, uh, if you have a leading edge product, it has been conditioned test as a normal SRL uh, for times when you're using it for overhead use uh, as a, a normal uh, SRL would be used. So these things are going to have been condition tested. I, I, I can't necessarily speak to whether or not it's going to have happened um, in the leading edge test as well. Okay, our next one, uh, there's an attendee who kind of describes a, a scenario and is asking for some input. says that we require an SRL when operating a man lift with the intent to prevent the operator from popping out of the basket, um, noting that the anchorage is typically below feet or at waist level. Uh, do you see any LE concerns with this application? Uh, so again, this is uh, when it comes to aerial lifts, we're talking about a topic that there are a lot of smaller points that I would need to make. Um, but if we're talking, for example, an aerial boom lift where you've got a basket on the end with an articulating boom that could bounce you out if a fall occurs, uh, there are a lot of people that like to argue that restraint is the way to go, so buy a fixed-length lanyard so that you can't get over the edge. My personal opinion is that's very difficult to do. Um, if you take a fixed-length, six-foot lanyard and, and try to tie off in a way that that person could never get over the guardrail, I feel like it's a very th difficult thing to accomplish. Um, the next Thing you could look at is a six foot energy absorbing lanyard. With those, though, again, we're talking 18 to 20 feet of fall clearance needed. Often the basket's not high enough um, to, to accommodate that. So I typically do recommend using a self retracting lifeline or specifically a personal fall limiter for that type of an application um, because number one, it's going to uh, lock up much faster. Maybe the person doesn't get thrown out of the basket in the first place. Uh, and then stopping distance is always very fast. Is going to be very fast as well. Um, I think the question about whether or not the guardrail presents a leading edge hazard is a very good one. Uh, I think the answer is yes. It could. It very well could, um, depending on the condition of those guardrails. If they're filed down, if you have, um, you know, certain things that make them a little bit sharper, uh, I would be concerned possibly about using any type of a standard lanyard or SRL going over that edge. So for me. Uh, I definitely would lean towards, say, maybe getting a, uh, a PFL that is leading edge rated as well for that type of an application. One caveat I have to throw in here is you got to check with the manufacturer of the lift to make sure the tie-off point is rated for fall arrest. Not all of them are. If we talked about scissor lifts, uh, which are devices that go straight up and down, they don't have the articulating feature, a lot of times those anchorage points are not rated for fall arrest. So you do need to check and see what the manufacturer stipulates. But if it's a fall arrest anchor in the device, um, I don't really feel like you can go wrong if you do a leading edge product as your connector. Next one, uh, does an SRL LE still work if you have two leading edges it's subjected to on its path down to a worker? Uh, I'm trying to think. Can you read the question one more time? I apologize. Oh, no problem. Uh, the question asks, does an SRL LE still work if you have two leading edges it's subjected to on its path down to a worker? Uh, I, I can't necessarily speak to that. Um, the one limitation that we, we – or one of the limitations we looked at at the end of the slideshow was currently they're not designed or tested for, for two edges. Um, I would uh, – I, all I can say is that's something that's possibly in the works. Uh, we, re we realize that uh, there are a lot of parapets and other scenarios where a couple edges might come into play. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be more design or more put in the test in the future for that. Uh, but until ANSI specifies a test for that, um, it's much harder for manufacturers to get on the same page as to what their different products are, are tested to. I think we're going to see more edges uh, allowed in the future. But as of right now, as of today, uh, you need to look at what's in your manual to see if they allow something like that. The product that I described here um, was not designed for going over those two edges. And again, that's because we haven't been giving a test, given a test for it yet. Uh, and as a result, um, more testing, more data needs to be collected still for that type of situation. Okay, well, well thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speaker. And once more, just want to remind everyone that this webcast will be archived at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events.
Um, once again, we also hope that you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen and give us your feedback. And that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Chris Irwin, everyone at MSA, and all of you who listened in. Thanks, and have a great day.